uh, hello there, um, to everyone who is in the waiting room. So, uh, yeah, uh, welcome, welcome to the to the lecture. Um, I hope everyone's doing well today. Um, oh, I actually, okay, the lecture should be back here. I, I'm, th that's the first, let's say, point that we're going to discuss, but we'll come to that in a little bit, I suppose. So, uh, while people, um, I don't know, arrive and stuff, um, I, I guess I'm going to discuss a little bit what, uh, what made me want to do this lecture. And, uh, as usual, it's one of you uh, NGD students that triggered me to lecture on this. So there was this really uh, fascinating Moyo game played by uh, two Nordic Odoja students that I reviewed just a couple of days ago. So then I scrapped my plans to make a, a different lecture and I went for Moyo. It's also a good excuse because I'm, I, I've am i been known to be a rather prolific Moyo player in the past. and It's... Um, I, I have quite some experience, I guess. Um, a lot of players aren't that um, aren't that drawn to Moyo. So uh, I I think uh, what I'm what I want to discuss a little bit um, regarding Moyo is how people treat it. So very often people treat Moyo like it's territory, like they make a big box and they're like, I want to make points out of it. And in my opinion, this is to a certain extent missing the point of Moyo. And that's what we're going to discuss. So, you know, these these big boxes, these big points of influence are actually much more uh, flexible and interesting than I think many people give them credit for. And I want to discuss that a little bit uh, throughout um, the games. Um, I also want to discuss to a certain extent how Moyo is made because in my experience, one of the things that you can't do with Moyo, or that is very hard to do with Moyo, is to force it. So it's um, a very delicate balance you have to play. Uh, oh, hello there, uh, Chris01. Um, yeah, welcome. So, the first example that I wanted to start off with, I thought was a particularly instructive one from the game of one of my students. And it actually represents a lot of concepts of Moyo. So so let's play a little bit through the game. It's like the first 40 moves. And we'll see how White, who's my student about 1Q level, um uh oh, he's playing he's playing well for a 1Q recently. Wow. Um <laughs> so um this is a game against maybe another 1Q level player and we'll see how White White my student develops a Moyo structure and then we're going to discuss that a little bit. Um so it looks kind of like a normal game at first, but maybe especially after this peep of blacks and white going for this uh, came out, we see that white's developing a very uh, concrete plan uh, and it's even aided. It's even aided by the stones on the top side. So even though the stones on the top side are not directly part of the Moyo, they're still supporting the plan of, the, of, of this um, framework that White's building. And my first question to the audience um, would be, well, what do you think of this position? Who would you be comfortable uh, playing here? Because I think a lot of players have very, uh, very extreme feelings about Moyo. Like, I, I think... I, I think, for example, the player with black here really disliked uh, black's position. He was like uncomfortable. Like, he's like, I know this isn't bad for uh, this isn't bad for me, but I feel uncomfortable. Seems about even. Oh, h hello there, flatter mouse. Ah, Marcel would rather take black. Maybe black's easier to play by a bit. Black, if it's black's turn, it is black's turn. Um, yeah, people coming in. So. Maybe some people would rather take black because, you know, we're attracted to, let's say, corner points, right? Black has um, a, a bunch of corners, etc. Uh, Siku says always white, which is interesting because later in the lecture we're going to discuss Siku making one of the most impressive Moyos in history. So, um, from my style, black, but I think it's playable. I think a lot of people would say that. Only because Q players are better at handling territory than influence Moyos. Um, yeah, maybe, arguably. Um, well, I, I hope to change that, or to help to change that a little bit. So, I think a lot of people would rather take black. And 
the reason is that white has all his eggs in one basket, and it's kind of hard to see where white's points are going to materialize. And this is one of the things about Moyo, that you have to have a very flexible mindset um, towards it, and you have to be very, um, very much willing to use the Moyo as a tradable currency, let's say. It is not something you have to try to keep, it's actually something you have to trade. Something that I've seen in a lot of my games is that I build big Moyos, and by the end of the game, my territory... Like, you know, my, my moyo has actually turned into territory on the side of the board, little by little. It's a very beautiful basket, I see. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, this that, this basket of whites is nice. I mean, I mean, um, maybe I've been influencing my students a little bit too much. <laughs> uh, though actually, actually, white played like this anyway, so, you know, I, I think. Student and, uh, and teacher somewhat aligned. After R14, now also black has some big influence, or Q14. Um, well, yeah, I mean, if black just plays R14, Q14, it is true that black's sort of building something on the right side. But I'd say that because white has A, which both expands white's um, scope and sort of limits black's, it's more white who's playing the Moyo game here. Especially we have to consider that black has a little bit of a weakness around R5. So it's not so, not so easy for black to build um, as for white, I think. So we're more talking about white's moyo. I wouldn't be very comfortable, but I still like white. Okay, so we've seen some opinions. Now, I think the general consensus seems to be that maybe you wouldn't take white, but it looks about even. And I think that that's probably fair because a lot of people just aren't um, very um, comfortable with playing moyo. But at the same time, I, I don't think white's done anything wrong. So, you know. San San Joseki, White Tenukis, we play another Joseki, we play another Joseki. Okay, one of these players should have Atari C7 or played D7. Um, you know, white, white, white should have gotten it out of the way in Sente probably, or Black should have exchanged D7 just to create some cutting points. But other than that, you know, it's a... I, I can't see anything wrong that either player did. So all of the moves had... All of the moves made sense individually, and and this is why I would call this something of a healthy moyo. So white hasn't sacrificed anything to get this moyo. White's just been playing normal moves. So the the really nice thing about a moyo is if you play moves that would make sense anyway, moves that you know don't give up something, and then suddenly you also have a moyo, right? So you know white's these structures of white's on the left and on the right side they would be useful on their own. They don't have to be part of this big Moyo plan to be, you know, decent, successful groups. But as it happens, they're working together. And that's why, you know, I, I wouldn't say white's better, but I, I would say that this, this position should be even. Now, the, you know, here, I think white has a nice Moyo. Like, this is, this is what I would characterize as a very, very playable type of Moyo that White's done well to, to create. So if you want to play Moyo, this is how, this is a good example of how you might do it. Um, sometimes Moyo developed out of your opponent playing super territorial. Yeah, yeah, that happens sometimes. So I think that ends up happening... Like, if you try and just force Moyo, you won't always get it. But what I've noticed is that against certain territorial opponents, you just end up getting a Moyo anyway. Like, it just happens. So I, I agree with that. Okay, so we come to a really interesting moment in the game. Uh, black exchange, yeah, okay, black made some exchanges, and now, yeah, black plays j9, which I think is a really interesting move. It, it forces white to make, um, a, 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 you know, a, a choice, which is why I really think Moyo is a very dynamic way to play Go. And uh, my, my question to the audience would be, what, what would you play here? What's your instinct? Uh, and I think we may get some really fun answers out of this. And uh, yeah, when I discussed this game with my student, this was by far the most interesting moment of the game. M10, Tanuki. Okay. Yeah, so we already have some really interesting ideas. So, a skill suggests M10, Letter Mouse suggests L10, and Chris01 suggests Tanuki. Maybe, I don't know, play on the right side or. Go for the top right corner. I don't know where the profit will be if I cap or shoulder head. So we're thinking of K10 and <clears throat> and J11. So okay, some interesting ideas. I think 
I, I'm guessing nobody will suggest my move. Um, well, my move is... Okay, I have two different moves. And one of them's Tenuki, but the other one I, I'm guessing people will not find. Um, because one thing that I'm concerned about for white... Oh, we have G9. G9 on the board. I, I'd be very interested as to why Siku wants to play G9. Ooh, even wider with L12. Well, so some people, some people really want to attack this stone. So A, B, and F have been suggested. Oh, G10. Okay, so some interesting ideas. Nobody wants to play G. I, I've not seen anyone suggesting that they just want to close off their moyo. Q15. Oh, Q15. Wow, Q15 is an interesting one. I don't want to commit with G. Kind of boring, this G. <laughs> well, I'm not asking if it's boring, I'm sort of asking if it's good. G seems like building territory from the Moyo seems wrong. Exactly, yes, Eskel. So, G... Uh, I was expecting some people to suggest G. And I think... I, I, I think a lot of players, though maybe less, you know, few, fewer players than I, than I would have thought, judging by the reaction of the, the people in this, uh, in Twitch chat. I thought that the reaction of some people would be, oh, I don't want to lose my territory. Like, I, I made the territory here, I want to protect it. And even though this isn't terrible in this particular situation, something that, yeah, Garden makes a good point, it can be pressed. This isn't solid territory yet. So, so when you play J7, what you're actually saying is, I'm going to give you like this, this, and Sente, because, I, you know, once I play J7, Marcel made a good point also, you're committing to protecting this territory. And that's actually not what you should use Moyo for. So when you have a Moyo, you are, you're building this framework that's very powerful. And when you try to make points with it, you're essentially going on the defensive. So that doesn't mean it's always bad. That just means that you may not be using it to its full potential. So I think G is a move that um, can be um, perhaps questioned as a, a little bit, yeah, a little bit passive and not using the stones for their purpose. So if you wanted to make points with the Moyo, then you'd play for territory because corners, you know, black, black stones are actually much better at making points than white in this situation. White's just playing for long-term compensation in a way because his Moyo is going to be more influential than black's Moyo. It's not meant to make points. So G, G is not a good move. Now, some people suggested Tanuki and I like Tanuki. I have to say, I think I would probably Tanuki. And this goes a little bit back to one concept of Moyo that is important. You don't have to build something great out of a Moyo. Like Moyo is a commodity you can trade. So let's say white plays R14. Let's say, you know, maybe black might jump. Well, white Tanukis again. Or, you know, white, white might enter the corner. White could you know, why could try and get some stones on, on this side of the board? I mean, probably the modern move would be to pincer for sure. Um, I, actually, it will also be the old move. It's even more the old move. So the point is that, okay, this Moyo is not making points anymore, you know, more than a few extra ones, you know, down here. But I think it's still abundantly clear that white stones, so A and B, are still going to be much more influential than the sea stones. So, you know, black's lonely jump in here, it's destroyed white's territorial potential, but it has not destroyed the usefulness of the Moyo. Arguably, it's given the Moyo a target for the future. So a lot of people, I think, would be reluctant to just let go of this territory or, um, you know, would want to try and, you know, play something like, you know, L10 was suggested M10 and try to attack this stone. That's actually not necessary. It's okay, but it's not necessary. And that's why I thought this position's a really dynamic one. White can be very, very flexible. In my opinion, there's many possible moves here. Um, not G, but many possible moves. And, you know, the reason I like Tanuki is that this Moyo will not stop being useful just because white Tanukis. So if black wants to sink more moves into making the Moyo impotent, then white will do other stuff. So... It's, it does not necessarily lose its power if it's not making points. Now, my move might surprise you. 
or like oh, Tenuki is one of my moves. The other move might surprise you. I want to Atari here and play F6. Um, which seems like a weird idea, I guess. Um, in the sense that, you know, if if we're talking about submissive, you know, J J7 was submissive, F6 is really submissive. Or so so it might seem. Now, for me, F6 is secretly the most aggressive move you can play on the board. F6 or F8? I'm not sure which one of them moves. Oh, I want the other connection. Yeah, yeah, AI also wants the other connection. So anti, anti in chat. Um, I wanted this area too. Yeah, so uh, wh when I was, uh, you know, I was discussing this game with my student and I, I kind of wanted to suggest F6. And the reason I wanted F6 was that there's still, I, I, I don't know, there's some annoying Aji, you know? Like, th isn't this Aji annoying? It's, it's a little bit annoying, right? So it, it, it's nothing for now, but it might be something later. So I, I didn't really want to leave this type of option open from my opponent. So if I were to play locally, I would play f6. Now, in my opinion, f6 is a little bit slow, so I would just tenuki. But if, if I were to play locally, it would be f6. Just because it, it seems that when I play f8, I'm leaving some loose ends. So, you know, this cutting point still exists, and I'm thinking of variations such as, you know, h3, and then if I were to just answer, then... White actually has some some problems on his hands, so this type of cutting point will be a problem. I mean, white, yeah, yeah. I mean, white. I mean, white's fine-ish, but you know, this type of variation where black might get a you know some ponuki, some kind of compensation, is annoying. So I don't want to leave that aji. Um, I mean, the what the AI told me was, well, you know, black's going to peep, black's going to peep at f8. And now you're going to be even more annoyed. That's what the AI told me, so. Um, White wants to play Outer Hane. Yeah, Outer Hane looks better. It's probably what I would do. But I, I don't want to leave this loose end. That's the point. So if I were to play locally, I would probably just defend with F6. And F6 seems like a strange move. Why are you going out of your way to defend the Moyo? The point is, it's not exactly a Moyo yet. And... You know, m something my students suggested was, you know, I'm strong with this Moyo, what if I try to fight? So I attach, and if black extends, well, I, I keep, you know, some big territory. And if if black Han is, I cross-cut and fight. And I, you know, when we were having this discussion, I thought that this is extremely risky for white, and the secret reasons are the cutting point at A and B. So, you know, we looked at some sample variations where... Uh, I guess black starts. Oh man, this is so delicious for black. I don't even know how to start. Um, let me remember some variations we discussed. So... Mm. Start with the cut. Then here. And then these cutting points are going to be fun. But you just have to find the right order for them. I mean, I guess everything's good for white. You just have to figure out an optimal way. So maybe Atari in here. Something like this. So idea being that whichever way that whichever way white chooses to to push, you're just hurting your own stones and maybe black's going to extend this way. So this is just a small example of that it's hard for white to fight so long as you have this problem. And actually, white's choice in the game reflects that very well. So white played uh, K10, which I think someone suggested, and, and my student was out for murder. Like, <laughs> or, I mean, murder is a relative word. I mean, he, he told me that he didn't necessarily want to kill, but the way that things turned out, he was forced to try and kill uh, in order to attempt to win the game. Which is actually the worst thing that can happen in Moyo. I hate it so much. So, you know, I've played a lot of Moyo um, in my life. And the thing I hate the most is when I need to kill my opponent. Because then it's like somebody's messed up. If you need to kill, somebody's really, really messed up. Because it, it like turns into this, I don't know, really barbaric thing where someone gets slaughtered. And, and like a lot, of the, some, a lot of the nuance around Moyo 
sort of goes away when you try and just kill. And that's sort of the situation that my student ended up finding himself in. Dragon Slayers, no, Dragon Slayers, t terrible, terrible letter mouse. So, you know, my, my student mentioned, oh, I wanted to keep pressure on this group. I wanted to attack and, and you know, profit. And I wasn't necessarily looking for a kill. But he also mentioned, before I knew it, I lost everything unless I kill. So White actually weakened himself quite severely by even going for this type of attack. So one example is one example is that White by pushing through and cutting compromises, you know, this cutting point. White's already, you know, all of these black moves are destroying any potential points White may have made. You know, this type of black peep is is threatening F, it's threatening G. So White White's really overextending here. And eventually, my student actually killed Black's group. And there, there's an interesting, um, an interesting thing about this game was that it was my student playing Jeff's student. So Black is the student of Jeff's, and they were playing in a tournament. So um, eventually, this Black group managed to die against all expectations. And I was like, yes, you know, it's like beating Jeff vicariously. So um, yeah, but in this position, White's White has a terrible position because unless White kills, none of White's moves make sense. And that's actually one thing about both attacking and Moyo that is very important to keep in mind, which is that whenever you make Moyo, whenever you attack something, you have to make sure your moves make sense anyway. So I'll give an example. So far, all of White's moves made sense anyway. So White played Joseki on the top left, Joseki on the lower left. Joseki on the lower right, answered a peep. This, I mean, this looks fine. It's not like Black's stones are fantastic and White's wall is, is decent. This looks like a joseki -ish sequence. And this Kema makes a lot of sense. It's a boundary between um, the Black square group and, and the White triangle group. And, you know, it would make sense even if White didn't have a Moyo. And then suddenly White has this Moyo out of moves that made sense anyway. So White, White made no or very small concessions in order to get this framework. Now, this changes right now. So in the game, White started making concessions. So White started destroying his own potential in hopes of killing. And he killed, so, you know, it worked out. And uh, it's not so easy for Black to survive here. And, you know, at, at the 1Q level, uh, Black ended up, um, ended up getting in trouble. But White had a much worse position for a long time because he needed to kill to win. And that's not the ideal way to use Moyo. Now, the, the reason I would, you know, just go ahead and, and fix if I were to play locally is that that's actually the best way to attack. You know, say Black Tenukis, now you can go very aggressive because you, you don't have weaknesses. And when you don't have weaknesses, then you can be very assertive. You know, if Black adds another move in the center and it's like, okay, I'll, you know, I'll escape now, then I'm like, Black played an empty move in space. And I fix a problem of mine, right? This this shape of white is an active issue. So I I think by fixing it, white's also still playing normal moves. And you know, and by normal moves I mean moves that would make sense even if we didn't have the whole board Moyo context. The strongest offense is a solid defense. In this case, yes. Now, I think F6 is a little bit slow. So what I told my student was, okay, if you want to attack, you should play f6, but I would just tenuki. Was black j9 okay? I, I think j9 is interesting, yeah. J j9 gives white a difficult choice, I think, because white has to choose between attacking, which is really hard because you have to realize that the first step to attacking is defending your shape with either f6 or f8, or you have to play tenuki, which is a very hard thing for many Moyo players to do. Like many Moyo players, like focus on their focus on their box, and they're like, "Yeah, I I want to build this box, or I want to use this box," and then I you know I'll y y this type of move makes uh, a difficult question towards White. So I actually like J nine. J nine's a nice move. I guess it depends if after um, K eleven. Black would want to continue with J9. Yeah, now, in my opinion, that's why F8 is arguably some sort of punishment. So let's say Black threw a random stone in the center, then Black stones are actually not that interesting. Like, White can just Tenuki and, and you know, arguably Black's moves are not doing that much. 
and they, they could still become some type of target. And as Prince Selina points out, maybe if I started with K Love and then I wouldn't want to play J9 next. So arguably J9 is not the optimal move, but I think for a Moyo player it's a very annoying one. So I think the average Moyo player will have a hard time answering J9. And I'm, my student did, you know, and my student at, at the 1Q level is quite an experienced Moyo player, so yeah. So yeah, this was I thought that this was a really interesting example because it showed the flexibility of Moyo in a lot of ways. And, you know, it, White in this position can use the framework in a lot of different ways. White could strengthen the framework and, and sort of try and use this entirety to eventually, you know, attack J9 or at least force K11, in which case I think K11 for F8 is, is a good exchange. Even K11 for F6 is a good exchange for White, in my opinion. Or white can tenuki and trust that this moyo will be useful in the long ter term, even if white isn't directly attacking. So I thought that this was this really showed, in my opinion, the really nice dynamic that moyo has, very like, very flexible, and a lot of whole board plans work very well with moyo, uh, so long as your stones are always kind of working together. And then you know territory isn't so material as stone coordination, um, and that's. And that's why, you know, it's flexible so long as your stones are happy, let's put it that way. Um, yeah, so just an interesting little example, a one-move example. And now we we get to the, the game that actually triggered me to do this lecture. Siku knows what I'm talking about. Uh, so, yeah, this is a game between two NGD students that I reviewed very recently. Um, is this the game? Yeah, yeah, this is the game. So, and White ended up making one of the most like massive moyos ever. So it's it's a very funny game. Um, this looks familiar. Yeah, exactly. I I published a review on this game only two days ago or so. And you know, it it doesn't necessarily look like White's going to end up building a huge moyo out of Fuseki. But oh, I I still have the markups from the review, unfortunately. So there may be a little bit of. Some extra markings, yeah, don't ignore those, I guess. So, I want to speed through the opening for, for a little bit. I think, yeah, I think White's moves so far are reasonable. I don't know what chat thinks. Oh, look, look, I'm already talking about the coordination between those stones and uh, suggesting A in the review. And what I liked about this game for White was that all of, again, all of White's moves made sense individually, except for E15. E15 is actually quite slow, but yeah. White's moves all individually made sense. So, you know, White played Joseki on the lower left. White cut D14, you know, which is a local shape punishment. Then White turned and forced Black to connect on, this, on the second line. So all of White's moves make sense individually. But suddenly, let's say that White played here, which is also sort of a, a quite... um quite a normal move, like, you know, it's treating the boundary between the M, M3 and K3 stone and it's sort of expanding. And, you know, all the entire, you know, the sides of the board are already taken. It's not like there's an urgent big move on the side of the board. So for me, a move like L5, uh, sorry, like L5 is already natural at this point. And then suddenly all of white stones are coordinating together. So this Moyo is sort of a bonus of all of white's stones that are reasonable anyway, coming together to build something nice. E15 was caused by a hallucination. Oh, I see. Um, I I'd argue that E15, like, I I'd say that misreads are sort of immaterial to whether E15 is a good move or not, because, you know, maybe black can live the D15 stone, but I think that white's natural reaction should be so what? Because white's strong on both sides. So even, you know, this is something I mentioned in, in the text review, you know, White's two groups are fine in isolation. So if Black wants to spend a move making life, then that's fine. So e even if Black can live, which Black can't. So. The logic was that then the middle cut um, kind of ruins my influence. Yeah, it kind of it kind of does, I, I guess. So so let's say, I I mean it kind of doesn't. Let let's say a a hypothetical world where Black gets out and, and pays a move to do so. White. I mean, maybe white pe peeps here, and this is actually annoying for black from a shape perspective. 
you know, this this cutting point is a little bit annoying, but that's the whole point with influence, Siku. You don't have to build this Moyo. Like, if Black wants to play E16, and then F16, and then, you know, play this Hane, and try and ruin your Moyo or something, that's fine. Because you haven't paid anything for this Moyo. You actually, th these stones are useful regardless. And already you've pressed black down on the lower side and are, you know, you're almost ready to build somewhere else on the board. So why hasn't paid anything in my mind? Why hasn't put all his eggs in one basket at all? Nah, somehow I thought I'd get Gote from the top. I mean, but uh, then we're getting to a level of, of, like, like, like so somehow if white takes Gote on the top, that's, that's just not happening. So, yeah. I think even in worst case, why can just defend the cut? Now the Moyo is even thicker. Well, that's what happened. So the Moyo does get even thicker, but I mean, E15 is a really slow move in the whole board context, just because, just because it's not that close to the Moyo. So it's it's just a little bit of a slow move that doesn't help the whole board plan that much. But yeah, hallucinations happen, Siku. You know, it's not, you know. Oh, defend E9 after black has E16. Oh, I see. Yeah, yes. E16 will always be Gote, so you could play E9 afterwards, yes. I wouldn't play E9. E9 is... Again, e E9 in this situation is the type of move that... It's okay, but you're serving the Moyo more than the whole board. Like, at this point, White's sort of saying that I want to build something, which is okay in this case because the Moyo is big, but I'd rather keep my options open and not play a move that whose sole purpose is to build Moyo, let's say. Though it does fix a cutting point, you know? So it's just it's just not a very important cutting point, in my opinion. So, it you know, you could argue for or against the move. Okay, so if we go a little bit further, yeah, I'm, I'm saying, you know, L5 is actually quite an urgent point. Yeah, L L5 is a really urgent point, and, you know, Black didn't play it for a little while. K14 has the right idea, but again, L5 is... Uh, L5 is sort of the move that connects all of White's influence, so, you know, I'm going to triangle them. You went bigger than Tengen. Yeah, yeah, so K14 has the right idea, but you need L5 first. Because that's what really makes your triangle stones coordinate. The right side, and this is something we'll talk about later, the right side is not part of this Moyo because all the stones are on the third and fourth line. And also black is, you know, high um, on the lower on the lower right corner. So, in my opinion, you were generally a little bit too ambitious with this Moyo, which is something we'll discuss. Um, if you want to build up, go for a real big like Tengen. Yeah, I mean, if you played L5, then Tengen wouldn't be an unreasonable move. So, yeah. Black, uh, Black played very solid M16, but then White finally got the, the L5 move. And in my mind, this Moyo is just... It's just beautiful for white because you know everyone played on the sides of the board. You know, you just everyone took the big points, and then eventually all of white stones got together and made this bowl of influence on the lower and left side. And white hasn't done anything, but suddenly he has this huge moyo. So, you know, if I think about lower left, it's a you know just a joseki normal trade of influence and territory. These stones that white got are sort of a surplus while black connected on the second line. This sequence was locally good for white. And then white just plays L5, which is it's just uh, the type of move you would play at move 50, you know, in the middle game. So there, now that there's nothing that urgent on the side of the board. So I, I love white's position. Um, <laughs> Mega Tengen, 11 Gen, Tent Gen, jeez. Oh my god, chat. Um, ah, anyway. Um, now, White has this sort of Moyo structure, and, and this is what I would call a, a again, a good Moyo. Like, the, this Moyo is healthily built. White has not sacrificed the whole board prospect, and it's just all of the stones are working together. However, the game from now on got a little bit worse for White, because White kept trying to build the Moyo despite it not helping out the whole, whole board plan. So this is where the game went a little bit not out of control, but White lost his lead, I'm going to say. So, Black attaches K2. And... Um, what Actually, how would you answer K2? 
this is maybe my first question to the audience. Um, actually, um, yeah, Siku, uh, you know, Siku answered in a little bit of an unorthodox way, but actually he had a decent reason. Like his his logic was reasonable. So White, what White did here was okay. Just um, want to discuss it because this is how White's play sort of escalated into building the one of the biggest Moyos ever, sort of. Bigger than the one he has right now. <laughs> um, but yeah, I think probably the the most obvious response would be J2. Oh, J2 and Cut is dangerous. So some people, okay, so some people, Siku wasn't the, the only one who was scared of the cutting Aji. I see. So actually, I would J2 because it's normal. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, J2, I would play J2 without thinking. But okay, some people are concerned about the cutting point, which is, it's a legitimate concern. So let's look at it. Um, what, you know, for those of you who are suggesting J3, what are you concerned about if Black were to play, um, like, sorry, if, if you were to play J2, what kind of sequence are you scared of now? What could go wrong? Because, you know, if, if White can... If White can block, get away with the block, and then the connection, then that's better than, than simply playing J3, because, you know, Black's going to push and get extra endgame, so... What's the concern here, in terms of the cutting point? Uh, and it's a valid concern, it's, it's good to think about it, I, I just don't think, in this particular case, I wouldn't be concerned. So, you know, Siku was concerned in the game, so a lot of, a lot of you are thinking like Siku. Um, you know, something Siku suggested, for example, was actually K4. K4 is more than cut. Okay, so some people are suggesting K4. Yeah, yeah, so K4 looks kind of severe. Of course, if you just connect, then black pushes through, and then your your coordination between your, your A and B stones is sort of ruined. So that's probably not good. Now, the sequence that Siku read in the game was, and we talked about this later in Discord, um, was black gets a ponuki but gets split on the on the lower side, and I thought this this variation was quite interesting. Uh, I don't know what what chat thinks. Uh, probably white would play something like j six next. That's my my instinct. Let's say. Oh, we want to play j four. J four sort of gets pushed around for the one stone, so you get one stone but you get pushed around. So for me, k is a little bit more trying to get all of these stones to work together still, so. Oh, as a response? Oh, as a response to... Yeah, we'll discuss We'll discuss J4 next. Uh, J J4 is also an interesting idea, but let's examine... Let's examine L4 first. Um, so actually, Siku mentioned that... I didn't, you know, he, he, well, he didn't like this because he's losing the lower side territory. Which, you know, it's a good reason to not like this sequence. You're sort of losing, you know, you're losing all of these points you used to have. However, something that I would point out, uh, which, you know, people don't always see during the game, is that let's think also about what Black lost. So if, if we go back. Yeah, I, I also missed during the game that Black loses. Yeah, yeah, Black loses her territory. So say Black connects. Well, yeah, connects with L2 and white defense. You know, later we can... I think we can sort of assume this endgame will happen. Actually, it's not so clear because white sort of isn't in trouble here. Um, but... Pronouns still confuse me. It's okay. Um, I guess. Um, you know, white white doesn't have that many points on the, on the lower side. Of course, you know, if we compare to the game, it's... You know, it's a solid 20 extra points. You know, 20, 20 extra points are, are not to be sneezed at. But black also has a lot of extra points. So if we go to, you know, all of these points that, you know, black uh, makes on the lower side are not made in the game. So if we go to this potential variation where uh, black, yeah, black pushes through, of course, one of white stones isn't very useful because it got captured on Ponuki. The M3 stone isn't very useful either. So, after white plays uh, J6, I think black actually should add a move here, potentially. 
Or if black doesn't add a move, so let's say black plays elsewhere, then white can go for g3, and actually if white's feeling very violent, white can try and kill. Well, white can try and kill here. But okay, let's let's not kill. Let's let's be peaceful and force black to live like this. And then white's made back a lot of the points, in fact. So white's still keeping the, the e6, e, um, you know, e5, etc. So this trade is a really interesting one because white loses a slightly bigger area, but white's whole board coordination is still intact. And also black arguably needs to add a move. So this situation looks okay for white, maybe even better for white, though that I, I wouldn't be sure about. The other move white can consider is j4, which, uh, um, which someone suggested in chat earlier. And the idea is that, of course, if black goes back, now we can connect. So, you know, black, black will cut this way, and now this starts some sort of running fight. And I think this running fight is interesting. I don't I'm not tempted to take white necessarily, just because in in the short run your shape kind of gets pushed around. So maybe it's like somewhere along the lines of this, and then the black group is sort of hard to attack. Um, so you know it's maybe okay for white, um, but I think black's okay. So you know maybe my move would have been L4. Now what happened in the game was okay. So white white chose to push. The idea being to prevent the cut at k4 from happening. And, you know, I, I wrote a long text about this move. Now, what it does do is it improves white's local shape. But what it also does is that white can't play j2 anymore, so you're losing some points on the lower side. And, you know, so far what white did is okay, because you're giving up a little bit of extra territory, but gaining some extra security in shape. It's not, you know, I, I don't think it's ideal, I wouldn't have done it, but it's okay. Now, this is the moment where I'd ask, you know, the audience, this is the really important moment. Uh, what would white do here? I, yeah, I admit that this is where I entered, oh, this is fun. Yeah, yeah, and actually, I have some personal experience to share about this. You know, something that I've noticed in my own go, especially when I play for Moyo, because Moyo is fun, I, I, I enjoy playing Moyo, is that... When making a moyo, I get enamored with the idea of making a moyo. And that means that I'll make suboptimal decisions just to get my moyo, you know? And then I'm like, my moyo, you know? And, and then I, I'm making, you know, suboptimal decisions to get to that position. And that's the thing about moyo, just like, uh, moyo is your sugar. Uh, it was. Now I, now I have different types of sugar, but for a while, moyo was my sugar. Yeah. Um, yeah. So... For those of you who don't know, sugar is a term that, you know, sort of become popularized because of uh, of Jeff, who's, you know, also an NGD teacher and uh, also my teacher, one of my teachers. Um, and, and the concept is, it's, you know, a detail or an aspect of the game that sort of obsesses you and you like it too much and you overvalue it. So Moyo is, is, is one of my sugars, yes. Not the only one, I have lots of sugars. So here, Moyo became white's sugar. So, you know, white, I, I think white looked at this, you know, previously this was the, this was the, the box that we were looking at, but now white was like, huh, what if we included these stones too? You know, what if we make it the biggest, grandest moyo ever? I think that's kind of how white was thinking. So this, oh, this is fun moment sort of, um, uh, affected white's play next. And, you know, if, if I were white. I think my move would quite simply be j3 for the simple reason that it's huge. <laughs> I mean, there's not that much to it. It's huge. So let's say that, you know, I play random move, um, black Hannes, then Atari, then Atari, right? Then connect, reverse sent a bit. Yeah, exactly. And then white, if white wants to keep the coordination between, um, between his stones intact, then White's got a turn. So what this means is that black has made, you know, some extra points. Uh, well, I, I guess some extra points has reduced all of these white points. Incente, right? 
And, you know, this looks like not that many points, but the fact that Black did this in Sente makes the value of this move just territorially more than the first move. So, I mean, that's, that's a lot of points. It's, you know, 15-ish points in Sente, maybe a bit more. And, you know, Black actually still has some Aji later. So, you know, maybe... I guess it's not that much Aji. I mean, White, you know, it's, it's more like just this push. So it's, you know, White, White sort of holds the line, but it's huge Sente profit. I mean, it's just... And I don't see any other obvious big move. Like, it, it's not like there's a move that, okay, here I close off my big Moyo area. Here I start attacking this Black group. Here, I, I don't see any move like that. So for me, it would just be J3 without thinking. It's just the biggest move on the board. To my counting, Black has under 75 points, White 60-ish without center. So I think play J3 to fix the shape. Yeah, so this is a sort of a lull state in the game where there's no big move. There's like nothing obvious for White to do. Because, okay, you could try and make all of the stones on the right side coordinate with the rest of your Moyo, but that takes a lot of moves. I mean, you have to somehow close this hole, then you have to close this hole. That's a lot of moves. You're not going to do that in one move. So, you know, and also these stones on the right side are very low. They're third line stones. Very hard to make those a working part of your Moyo. And there's no big moves on the side, there's no weak groups, J3 is just the move here. And, you know, if white plays J3 and we evaluate board position, black has, let's see, 10, 20, 30... Yeah, I, I, I'd say that, uh, you know, black has maybe 70 points. It's a little bit, you know, between 65 and 70 points, I guess. Maybe I'm being a bit pessimistic counting for black, but that's generally how I count. And then white has maybe a little under 15 on the top left, maybe 10, arguably 15 on the right side, more like 10. And and Komi, so white has 30 plus this box, you know? And this box, like, you know, this box, um, is it going to be 40 points? We don't know. It's going to be worth a lot of points in the long run, so... I play L15 and Sente and claim the top is sealed, Kappa. Nice. Yeah. L15 Sente fixes everything, of course. J2 isn't working. Oh, that's a really good question, Vidomina. So, the problem with J2, like, it's working in the sense that if black cuts, you're not going to die or anything. I, I agree with that. However, let's, you know, let's play out this fight for a little bit. Let's say black pushes. I guess you Yuhane. Let's say Black Hanes, you go down. Let's say, uh, go down, go left, I guess, something like that. And, you know, let's consider, is this the Black move or is, I guess this jump is the Black move. Yeah, I think, I think I like this Black jump. So, you know, let's say Black jumps here at J5. You're not dying with anything, but you've weakened yourself. So you've, you've just created a cut group. So it's, it's very questionable if you want to allow black this opportunity. So maybe black won't even do it now, maybe black will do it later. But the fact that this Aji res resides in the position, black could be really nasty and attach here potentially. But I don't know if that's a good move. It's just, it's a mean move, but I don't know if it's a good one. I would play this and invite black to <laughs> try and die bigger. Well, let's say, I, I understand your thought process. So, you know, you could argue, I don't know if you're correct, but you could argue that if black plays this way and, and you know, white gets to play K7 and try to murder everything, then white might be fine. But I, I just, you know, if I were white, I wouldn't want to be in a situation where black, you know, plays K6 shoulder hit and I'm forced to connect because the Aji is too bad, you know? So I think that's um, that's what I would be concerned about. And that's the thing about leaving cutting points and shape problems. Maybe you don't have to, you know, you're, it's not a problem now, but it's going to be a problem later. So, you know, let's, let's, Hane, let's shoulder hit for black and let's, uh, whoops, let's jump. Now this is going to be a problem. Like if, if you don't add a move, then this will be a problem. Because at this point, you're weaker than black is in the local area. Like, your, your L3 group's actually in trouble. So, it's like, this, this is just constant depth that you have to keep in mind. So, and I don't think that's worth, I don't think that's worth the extra, um, the extra points that you may or may not get. So, 
Yeah. This reminds me, I played a teaching game with Anti uh, very recently, and uh, and I actually played this Hana instead of this extension in a relatively similar situation, and then Anti showed me why he's my teacher and I'm his student. Man, I got crushed. <laughs> and uh, largely off of this cutting point. So I had a very similar situation where I, I played the J2 type of move, and and I, I got completely destroyed. So, okay. White's move, O6. And O6 is an interesting move because you can see what white's looking at, right? I, I, you know, I line out the triangles, I, you know, but the issue is that this thing has holes everywhere and white's starting to play moves. And this is the, the point I want to stress. White's making moves that wouldn't make sense anyway. Like you're not, O6 is an empty move unless you get to play here and here and here. Well, not end here. I mean, two two moves is enough unless you get to play extra moves and make the whole thing into a box. So it's already what one might call an investment into the moyo, which is not inherently a bad thing, but something you have to be very wary of. Ceiling in the Q3 group has no extra value since Q3 is super alive. Yeah, yeah. And actually, O6 even has a local problem with P6, and we saw later in the game that Y had to connect in Gote and give black extra endgame at R6. Um, moreover, it gives... Um, you know, it, it gives this this B move in Sente for later, which is you know very uh, like like we said, very big territorially. So if I were black, I would certainly just get these exchanges out of the way in Sente. Then you know probably jump here. I think because I, I don't believe I, I mean white can try this, but this fight I actually think should be okay for for black. Um, it's a bit risky, but generally white has. White has the worst shape, so this should be okay. Um, it's a little complicated. If you're scared, I guess you can play the... I guess you can, you know, peep here, and then, you know... And then jump, or then Ogema, or something like that. No, not this. And then Ogema. And then, even if White, let's say, gets to keep the left side of the Moyo, you can see that this O6 move isn't going to be a part of that Moyo. So White's move is probably um, not really optimal, and I think it actually throws away most of White's lead in this situation. And, um, you know, Black um, black didn't really go for J3 yet, which is some somewhat reasonable. Like, if your opponent doesn't show priority for J3, then somehow I think I think Black was justified in not directly um, taking it. Black should have, but I understand that she didn't. And then P13, I, I think, kind of goes along the lines of, oh, I want to get a move in the center and reduce you. And then white actually doubled down. Well, actually, at this point, like, tripled down on, uh, on the Moyo and played, um, played O12. Which is really, you know, it makes sense. I mean, you've played O6, you've got to play O12 here. But, you know, as I add in my text commentary, you're throwing away the stone at A. So, you're, yeah, you're not helping yourself necessarily. And that's why I suggested you should play C, because C is, like, not... C is not giving anything up for, you know, and, and O12 is actively giving something up for the Moyo. And to be fair to white, this is the type of situation where you're almost justified in going for the big Moyo dream because it's such a big Moyo. However, you still shouldn't do it. It's like more acceptable. And, you know, white was never truly behind in this game. White just lost his lead. Um... So the stones white played for his wall on the left were not an investment in the moyo, they didn't lose anything, but O6 is. Is that a way of seeing this? Yes, exactly, that's the point I want to make. So when white played on this side of the board, I mean, even if white doesn't build a big moyo, even if white never uses these stones as part of this dream moyo plan, I think it's very arguable that they're more useful than A and B are, because black's playing on the second line to make five points. So this influence will still be useful. I mean, these outside stones will still find a use in the game, even if there's not this big Moyo plan on the board. Conversely, when white plays O6, white is purely banking on the building of the Moyo, which is usually a bad thing. Not always, but usually. So you have to be very careful when you play moves. And, and actually, I say this to my students when they're attacking as well. So when people are attacking, just like when they play Moyo, they focus only on one very specific detail or aspect of the game and they forget the rest of it. So just like Siku this game was, yeah, I want to, you know, 
you know, this is fun. I want to build this Moyo. Um, I, you know, look at all my stones working together. But he accidentally started giving away points on the margins of the board. And we'll see that in the game, how, how Black actually um, equalized the game. You know, Black was behind. And Black managed to equalize the game because even though White kept a lot of his Moyo, he paid way too much on the sides of the board. And yeah, that's the important thing about many concepts in Go that you shouldn't give up the rest of the board for the plan. Like, you should make the Moyo work with the whole board plan, not sacrifice it, let's say. So, okay. Black gives up more, but there's actually still a problem in L13. So, you know, white gave away half of, of, of this attachment, which black can play later to get some points on the right side. And also black still has this attachment. So, you know, white didn't really close off the box yet. In my opinion, L13 is really hard to deal with, because if you just extend or something, black's worming her way into your territory. So, um, that's very difficult. And if you just keep conceding, then, I mean, this box... This box is going to end up being, like, really small, eventually. So, Black's actually going to win like this, I think. So, uh, L L13 would have been a hard move to deal with. So, White exchanged. Yeah, and then M13 was a little bit of an inaccuracy. I think it should have been L13, just because this way White can sort of pretend he's holding the the, uh, the Moyo. And like I said, uh, like my commentary is like, indirectly justifying A, because the stones are sort of working together now. Um, and you know, that's why White's, White's Moyo policy here is not entirely unjustified, though it's, you know, probably not ideal. And I think eventually, I think now White played H, sorry, Black played H3. Yeah, H3 is not optimal, I think. Uh, J3 is a little bit more severe to the local shape, but it's okay. And, you know, Black ended up just taking R13 profit, uh, I think in the next move, White defended... Yeah, White defended L11, which is reasonable because if, you know, let's let's say you play here, then Black's going to end up cutting and you're, you know, you can't hold everything. You're going to have to give up something. So, oh, whoops. So maybe like this. Oh, hello, Zogi Zogi. Welcome. Uh, you know, and this is actually a big loss because it's like Black's building some extra points on the top and you're getting reduced in, in, in Gote, right? So. And, and you know, at this point in the game, what I said was that the game's too close to call. Like after Black takes R6, the game's really close. I don't know who's better. And this means basically that White's Moyo of strategy has not really been successful because as we discussed at this particular point, Black A, B, and C have been a little bit slow and allowed white stones to coordinate in too much of a natural way. And, you know, it, this means that white should definitely have the, the much better position. And throughout the rest of the game, white expanded the Moyo plan but actually hurt the whole board. And in the end, you know, black made profit A, B, you know, C. It, it's just, and, 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 you know, white actually ended up adding one, two, um, yeah, this is like three, you know, four. White ended up adding many, many moves just in order to close off the Moyo, which made the investment not worth it. Even though the center is big, the profits that Black gets on the sides of the board ended up adding up to more. And this game's really close now. Now, this game, in the end, White won it in the end game. You know, White, uh, you know, played, um really, you know, White played well in some tactical exchanges uh, in the end game, and then ended up winning by quite a bit. Um, unfortunately, you know, Black made some misreads and stuff, but I actually think Black did a very good job throughout the middle game of sort of reducing and uh, chipping away at White's Moyo dream until it was never really worth it for White to have started this in the first place. And I, yeah, I thought this, this was a really fascinating example of a Moyo game. Uh, and yeah, to recap... I think that, for example, servicing the lower side just because of how big it is, um, and you know, in this case, you give up the your lower side, but you destroy Black's lower side, making it kind of an equal exchange. Um, and you know, in case Black connects, and White connects, and you're sort of building, you're sort of building the Moyo without jeopardizing the rest of the game, and that's the point at hand. So, that's kind of the, the. 
the point I want to hone in on. When you're building Moyo, you can't just think about the Moyo. Uh, the whole board is important. Sometimes they're the same thing. Sometimes the whole board and, and the Moyo are the same thing. Or you can service them at the same time. Sometimes you can't. So that's uh, maybe a good place to finish uh, on this particular game. Uh, now, uh, this is uh, the part of the lecture where uh, we get to my games, and actually the lecture's already gone on for one hour, um, which is more than I, like, I, I, I doubled a long time in these games more than I intended to, which is fine. Uh, but let's now take a quick look at some of my Moyo games that I've played uh, throughout last year when I was playing a lot of Moyo. Now I don't really play as much Moyo. Uh, somehow it, yeah, somehow I stopped. But I played a lot of Moyo, and looking back on the games, uh, I'm not bad at Moyo, so hopefully uh, I can show some of the things I was doing well and also show some of the things I was doing badly because in retrospect I, I don't agree with everything I did. Uh, and sometimes I, I fell prey to this concept of building the Moyo, you know, without actually helping the whole board, like sacrificing parts of the board or sacrificing things that are just too big just to keep the Moyo dream alive. But in general, I think I played some good Moyo games and, you know, we can take from my mistakes and, and what I did well as well. So, yeah, this game is... Wait, which which game did I have first on the list? I played a lot of Moyo games. Um, yeah, okay, so this game is... Uh, I, I played it online during one of... Um, you know, during uh, just an online tournament uh, that I, I, I organize for uh, training purposes. Um, and I played it against Valery Krushelnitsky, who's probably rated about 25-50. He's about 6 down right now. Like, weaker 6 down, stronger 5 down. And I was white. So let's keep going for a little bit. So, so you know, the first thing that happens is that I played h4, which is sort of pointing at black shape. Black attaches under. And we get a sort of Josek-ish structure where I get Sente, I get a little bit of influence, Black gets a little bit of territory, looks about even. Next we play another Joseki, and you know, this is something I'm relatively good at. I play normal Joseki sequences, and then suddenly they balloon into a Moyo, because that's what how I that's how I rolled, you know? <laughs> um, I think I played, yeah, I think I played D9 next. Again, we played a Joseki sequence. This is, this is all Joseki. I'm not sure I agree with e16 like Tenuki did. And yeah, yeah, this is the first move that um, I played that is really interesting from a Moyo perspective. Because so far, you know, white white got some extra influence. White um, has been playing generally a bit more towards the outside. But it's not a big concrete Moyo yet. I mean, black can, you know, you, you, almost, you almost see the blackstone here, you know, sort of preventing the Moyo from really doing anything um, on a large scale. But also, white's moves made sense anyway. Um, if you always take the influence side of a Joseki, eventually there will be a Moyo. Um, event, you know, there will often that's the case. Yes, uh, but in this case, it's arguable that there isn't. You know, so if white wants to build this into a big Moyo plan, you have to spend an extra move, and. Not only an extra move, but also a move that, you know, leaves a lot of residual weaknesses. I mean, black, we are giving black a cutting point here, which black can fight with in the future. It's really giving shape problems, you know? So, um, but at the same time, the sides of the board are kind of taken, and, you know, the whole board plan for white is, is sort of important. Um, so... Here's, you know, my question, uh, my question to you people is what would you play here? Would you try and play a move like f6, f5 and, and try to get all of these individual pieces of influence to work together? Or would you, for example, just, uh, you know, play n17 and play a big move on the side of the board, invade r17? You know, in retrospect, I'm somewhat interested in, in just making myself a base on the lower side and, uh, you know, trusting that all of my outside stones, you know, outside stones are useful even if they do not uh, work together, right? So I was looking at M17 instinctively. Yeah, M M17 is a move. Uh, I might be looking at attaching N17 for Sente, but that also hurts the corner, so maybe not. Uh, you know, you could invade and make life on the on the top right corner. 
There's a lot of different things you can do that don't directly go from Oyo. P3 is my first instinct. Okay, P3. Make F5 more expensive. Okay, so so a lot of people are tempted to play uh, more towards the sides of the board than the center, and this maybe shows my tendencies as a Moyo player. Like, maybe a lot of people... Oh, wait, excuse me, wait. White has defended C11 first, and now... Now after Black Satari, now we, you know, choose whether we play F5 or not. Um, I'm traumatized playing full Moyo, says Zogi, yeah. So... Okay, so attaching to the small Shimari, make, and R9 makes it even more attractive. Yeah, sort of, when when Black builds these stones, then the white Q8 stone sort of works against that. And, you know, white can get a base on the lower side. Um, F6, F6 or P5. So someone someone's also thinking about... Okay, so here we have um, uh, Rofarst going for, you know, trying to build a little bit with the whole board plan. And, you know, that's uh, also reasonable. To me, it's a little bit of a hard decision in this situation. Um, I think the problem with p5 is that black gets to play g5 eventually. Like, well, maybe, you know, black pushes and, and then plays g5. And then it's sort of hard to build the moyo. Like, to me, to me, it's either f6 or f5 or nothing. Because then you're sort of coordinating with the left side as well. And I chose to play f5, but I don't think f5 is a good move in retrospect. So, you know, actually... Uh, during the game, I I thought I played, you know, I thought I played well, and afterwards I, I thought I, you know, this was one of my better games, like, in my life. Um, and the AI agrees. I, I played well. Like, I think my maximum percentage drop was actually, like, 5%, even though there were a lot of 5 percentage drops. But, um, you know, 5 percentage drops are not terrible. So I, I played a good game, but this is one of the 5 percentage drops, let's say. And at the time, I liked the move anyway. I was like, I don't care what the AI thinks. You know, when I reviewed the game, I was like, yeah, I like this move. And in retrospect, I don't. And the reason is, you know, just like P5 does, you know, F5 pays a little bit too much. Like here, you're spending move, you're spending a move and creating a weakness around G5. And if you if you think it's not a weakness, you'll see that later in the game, Black played here. I, I had to protect a weakness, you know, around K6 and let Black take in Ponuki. So um, this this is a weakness um, that could be exploited later. And, you know, it's, it's not terrible because I do have a very nice Moyo structure here. And there's nothing that urgent on the board. So M17, P3, etc., etc. They're not that annoying, right? So, so, sorry, not that annoying. They're not that big. So I, I definitely understand that I played F5. But again, we're investing in the Moyo rather than following the whole board plan. And that's why I don't like the move very much. It's okay, but I don't like it very much. Okay. Now, um, yeah, I what I did here was also a very similar idea. Yeah, so now I'm build, really building for the whole board plan. But I'm giving black M3, which is just going to passively capture the entire lower side. So I'm paying the entire lower side, potentially, in exchange for the Moyo plan. And to me, this is, again, a slightly suspicious idea, because if you look closely, white's Moyo has a lot of problems which may get exploited later. So it's not... Ah, it's, it's a little bit held together with, you know, not so solidly. So in retrospect, again... Now that I'm a little bit of a different player from, I don't know, last September, I think I would be more tempted to just, you know, I, I mean, I understand that these stones are going to be useful all on their own, and that I don't need to, you know, build something great with them for them to be useful. So I would be unwilling to give so much profit away. Um, with that said, what I did was okay. Like, the, I'm being reasonable here. So it's not, it's not a terrible idea because it is a very big moyo. And now we come to the moment in the game that I think is the most important. Black pushes f16. And this is maybe the point where I ask the audience, what would you do, let's say? Uh, yeah, what's your, what's your reaction to this as white? Which move, sh which move uh, speaks to the audience, let's say? Um, time to grow. Time to grow. G13? Yeah, G13 is my first instinct as well.
G16. Okay, someone wants to Hane. H17, somebody wants to play on the on the top side. So here we have that discussion again. So push helps black, those stones are hard to kill though, I like Tanuki. Okay, so some people like Tanuki, uh, some people want to use Tanuki to sort of keep building the dream. Uh, K3, don't build the lower side, uh, don't pay the lower side. Oh, so we want to Tanuki and, and, you know, I'm not sure about K3 because black can still jump, but if white were to play locally, it would maybe be something like M4, connecting all the stones. So, yeah, we have, we have some ideas here, or actually, uh, M4 actually has some issues still, hmm. Maybe M3, but so we have a lot of different ideas. Uh, I think in my case, my first instinct is definitely to play G13 because it's servicing the whole the, this whole board moyo very well. However, however, um, in a local sense, Black's move is very weird. F16. So the reason it's very weird is that it's walking into a honey of the head of two, two stones. So. Uh, and the reason Black did this was like, okay, if you Hane, then I'm going to get to, like, uh, I think, you know, just sort of build while, not build, but like inhibit your Moyo while, you know, I, I pay these, you know, I, I give you this Hane on the top side, but I'm limiting your Moyo. So that was Black's language. But Black, locally, Black's walking into a terrible shape allowing this Hane, and Black would never do this. So... Um, you know, during the game, even though my first instinct was to play G13, I ended up opting for G16. And the reason behind that is that Black's shape sucks now. I mean, I mean, so I'll, I'll give a little bit of, uh, a, well, I'll give an example. I mean, the game is a good enough example. I played J J15 Hane, threatening F15 cut. Black was forced to defend F15, uh, and then I got to play G uh, J14. Which actually means that these two stones are working really well with the Moyo anyway. Um, and I'm actually quite happy about how I played this because even though G13 is the obvious move, we're paying this Hane. So in the long run, Black paid too much to reduce the Moyo. Exactly, exactly. And this is the part, um, th this is what I think is really important to talk about when we play Moyo. Moyo is expendable. So, yes, in the game, my Moyo is, you know, theoretically a little bit smaller because Black's going to get to jump in and reduce. But it's not like my Moyo was closed if I jump. I mean, Black can still, you know, wait, uh, wait let's go over here. Um, it's not like the Moyo is closed if I jump. It just means that Black can reduce this way later instead. So it's not finished yet. And I'm making a huge payment on the top side because eventually, you know, black, black's probably going to take here now, or extend and, you know, then take here, and then I'm, I'm probably going to be forced to live up a little bit small, and then eventually get reduced anyway, so. And, you know, black may start annoying me with such an attachment, and the moyo may end up being deceptively small. And that's the thing with center points. G6, G13 is trying to make points with the center, and it's not an unreasonable move because it's a really big center, you know? So th this is such a big center that you might even want to make points with it. But it's actually just better to take control of the top side, make sure your group on the top side is fine, punish Black's shape mistake and make him connect F15. And then at the end of the day, your Moyo plan is actually, um, your Moyo plan is actually still intact. Your stone coordination is still good here. And now, on top of that, you have points on the top side. So, uh, G16 is better than F16. Um, but G16 might be an easier punishment. You think G13 is better? Okay, that's interesting. In my mind, I, I really liked what I did in the game. I was very proud of it. I'm still very proud of it, because it was recognizing that in the long term, shape is more important than the whole board plan. And ironically, not ironically, but perhaps surprisingly, once I, I took, you know, that I, I paid attention to the shape. Oh, better than Black's move, I see. Yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. So, um, in the long run, by paying attention to the shape dynamic on the top side, 
I ended up expanding my Moyo anyway. So yeah, J14 just feels so good when you get J J14, because even if white jumps in, you're still going to keep such a big area. And on top of that, you kept the top side intact, and maybe M17 will make you some points later. So I, I really like that here I was flexible. And actually, G13 is still better for white. So F16 is just a little bit of a strange move, and um, after G13, white's still better. So, you know, um, G13 isn't a terrible move, but G16 is best. And up, up here, I, I, I played quite well, I think. And this showcases one of the really nice things about Moyo. Moyo is a very flexible thing, and it's a commodity. It's not... Once you play G13, like, as white, if we had played G13 here, we're committing to make... We're committing to defending, you know? The takeaway is do not force Moyo, use it to make a positive exchange rate. Yes, that's. I think that's a good way of summarizing it. Very often, you don't actually end up making points in the center. You use the center as leverage. And to me, a great example is F16. So Black was, you know, worried enough about this Moyo that he was willing to let me Hane on the head of two stones and then endure this connection at F15, which is like, you know, very inefficient and let me get J14 just so he has an easy way to enter my Moyo. And if I were white, I'd be like, yeah, fine. I pay part of my moyo, but you're you're doing this stuff, which is ridiculous. So, um, and I'm I'm not saying I'm not saying that what Black did was ridiculous. What Black did it was actually somewhat reasonable. Um, I, what I mean is that Black's doing something locally ridiculous in order to deal with my moyo, and that's actually good enough. I don't have to build points with my moyo. I need to exchange it for something uh, equally good. Now, sometimes you end up making points with your moyo, but more often than not the correct thing to do is to treat Moyo very, very flexibly and understand that, you know, you can give up points in the Moyo in order to get things somewhere else. And when you, you know, th that's the thing about Moyo, if you choose to make points with it, it's like you're using an offensive tool defensively, which is bad. Like, Moyo, it, the moment you decide to make points with it, you're playing on the defensive and you've lost the initiative, which is not what Moyo is about. So I think here I, I, I played quite well. Um, don't go for the kill, exactly. So when you attack, you're also not usually investing for the kill. You're not you're not all inning hoping that your Moyo becomes points. You're using your Moyo as leverage to get more points in the long run. And, you know, many people get very annoyed. So if we go back to the first example here on, on the top side of the board, uh, like, if, if we go back to the example I showed at the beginning of the game, many people would be annoyed that they're losing their J7 points. Like, oh, Black plays J7 and I have no points. And actually, my, my student considered playing J7 in this board position. But the whole point is that this Moyo is not being played in order to make points... Um, in, in order to make these points. Th th that isn't the purpose of this Moyo. And that's something that I think is important to understand when you play Moyo. Um, okay. Uh, Qs don't, don't respect thickness and make crazy invasions. What are you supposed to do? Don't try and kill. Moyo is not there to enclose the points, Sogi. Like, yeah, usually. Sometimes it is, but usually it is not. So keep in mind that an invasion is not always bad for you. A suggestion for the next lecture. If you could make the, coordinate, the coordinates bigger, that would be great. Um, they're very tiny. It's hard to read them on the phone. Okay, I'll I will take that into account, Flutter Mouse. Thanks. Um. So yeah. Um. So the bo so the Moyo is a bonus for from your effi already efficient wall that you can trade for benefits uh, elsewhere. Yeah, exactly, exactly, Marcel. So, uh, ex yeah, I think a lot of people in chat have this correct. So, the way that you treat Moyo ideally is that Moyo is a natural surplus of the way that you've played, where the, your moves themselves were not payments. You know, you're not investing to make the Moyo, it just to a certain extent happens. And, uh, or the payments that you've made are, are minor. And what that means is that you can treat Moyo very flexibly. Like, if in the end my stones don't end up making a huge Moyo that encloses a lot of points, well, the thickness is still going to be useful and I can trade it for something else. The worst type of Moyo is the Moyo where you've invested so much into the Moyo, and this is the situation um, The situation that's um, in the second game we looked at, so in this one, right? 
this is the problem that Siku ran into in his own game, where... Uh, oh, whoops, no, not this sequence. Uh, the, the, the problem that Siku ran into in, in this game was that he started trying to make points out of this Moyo and trying to expand it in a territorial sense, which is not efficient. And that's how it ended up becoming a problem. So yeah, I think I understand it logically, but emotionally it's hard. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, I say this as someone who has quite a lot of experience playing for Moyo, and I've not always thought about Moyo like this. It's been a gradual process, and I think now I'm a much better player because of that. But, you know, it's not something that I've understood forever. Um, I think, I think I you know, being 5 done, um, you know, in 2018, 2019, I was still very much trying to keep center points, which is not good. Um, a wall is a floating baseless groove, Chachikun. <laughs> I mean, maybe. I mean, depends. But, yeah. And, uh, emo emotionally, well, San Sa yeah, NGD teachers, good puns. Except for me. Um, so, yeah. So going back to this game, I'm actually quite proud of how I played this, where I, I treated the Moyo very flexibly. Um, and now, actually, uh, yeah, we get to this situation. This is the last, I'll, I'll wrap the lecture up after this example, but I want to end this game because I think I kept playing uh, in, in, you know, well. What would you play here as white? What's your instinct? What's the next move? And actually... Uh, I think Black Black already showed um, interesting flexibility in mindset as well. I mean, Valery is n not a bad player at all. Uh, he's, after all, also, uh, you know, 5-6 done. Um, N16. We play N16. M17 Instinct. Okay. L5. What if Black plays B8 now? Let him live? B8. No, B B8 gets killed. I mean, B8's gonna get murdered, Zogi. Black's not living in there. Um, I still want to fix that E5 area. Okay. K3 still sent that threatening, threatening D2, a uh, C2. Um, K3 is a pretty big move, but I mean, it's not really threatening that much. It's it's threatening C2 in the uh, random move for Black. Black wouldn't actually play there. It's threatening C2 in the sense that Black probably isn't going to Hane. Uh, so you could think about it. Yeah, it's a big move. Uh, people are also thinking of M17, right? Okay, so we agreed you need to kill crazy invasions. Yeah, I mean, if someone makes an invasion as crazy as C8, you kill it, yes. But L5 threatening to, um, to, to connect O4 and fix shape. L5 is actually a good move. I, I didn't think of, uh, L5 during the game, but it's actually a good exchange. And later in the game, this became a problem for me, L5. So that's actually a very nice suggestion, Mardi Pref. Let him live if he invade your Moyo, not when he invade your territory. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, I, I think I was a little bit tempted to play F10 here and just try and close off the Moyo. But again, let's say I play somewhere else, Black, you know, plays F10. I'm still largely going to make points in the center. Even if I Tanuki again, I'm still making points in the center. So this is all very relative, you know. Again, when you play F10, now our Moyo is sort of turning into a territorial area. And territorially, Moyos are not very important. So at this stage of the game, even though F10 is a big move and kind of connects everything, I ended up deciding against it and invaded on the top right, which is the correct decision. Um, and... Um, Actually, oh, I exchanged this, never mind. But uh, yeah, then I invaded. And interestingly, what happened next was that I gave black an entry into my Moyo, right? So this stone is, is an annoying entry into, into my Moyo, but I made points on the top side, right? I made all of these all of these guys on the top side, and I reduced his corner. And by this point, I've almost entirely given up my Moyo dream because let's say that, you know, eventually... Uh, I mean, now I turned G11, but, um, you know, Black's still going to maybe get L16 in Sent and then play M12, after which my Moyo is sort of gone. But the point is that I already profited, you know, upwards of 25 points on the top side. I can let my Moyo go. 
So that's um, that's why I think this is quite okay for white. Actually, white's better. This this result on the top side is fantastic for white locally. Uh, I mean, I got Q, Q18 in Sente. That's unbelievably painful for black. Uh, in fact, uh, R19 Hane will still be my Sente. So black actually has to answer this because... Oh wait, black doesn't. But, oh wait, black does. Black actually doesn't because... Um, like, if I go down, black makes an I. And if I play here, black... Oh, whoops. And if... I play T18, black plays here and here. So, but in at least at least R19 is incentive, but that would be insult to injury, you know. So, um, so in the end, what happened was that uh, if we go forward a little bit, yeah, I ended up paying from my weakness by giving away this ponuki, and eventually, I think I even, I think I tenuki at some point. Yeah, yeah, so here there's some Aji, which means that I'm never going to make that many points in the center, this type of Hane. I'm basically going to answer here, or something. I, I'm not going to fight it. I think fighting it... If I remember correctly, fighting it ends badly. Wait, Hane... And then... Somehow white gets in huge trouble if I if I try too hard here. Forget how. See here? Oh yeah, white resigns. White resigns now. I think. Because here black double Atari's and you can't connect. And... Here black double Atari's and then cuts. And then white's dying on the right side. So white has to be very careful, right? So I know that this Hane exists and I'm like, I'm gonna just, you know, chill. And the point is that this center has already been traded for other things. And that's what I liked about this game. That's what I was proud about. I eventually just turned this Moyo into points on the side of the board. And even though there's this open center area, I, I used this game actually for my end game lecture where we were discussing if F white F7 is worth playing, trying to solidify more center points. Um, and you know, uh, in the end, my center wasn't that big of an wasn't that big of a resource. You know, I got some points, but not that many. And a lot of my profit was actually made up on the um, on the top side of the board. At the end of the game, you make no points in the center and conclude the moyo is useless. That's Prince Alina. No, I mean, I conclude that moyo is a commodity that can get traded. And that's that's the thing. So my moyo was useful. I just in the final form, points were made elsewhere. Like, uh, and yeah, I think that's maybe the the interesting conclusion to take out of such um such a game. And I thought I played this very well. Now, I want to say that in retrospect, I wouldn't have played so hard for Moyo in the first place. So let's go here, here. I, I wouldn't have played F5. I wouldn't have played this sequence in the center, which gives N3 to black later, which makes a lot of points on the lower side. And um, I think that I, I wouldn't have leaned so hard into a Moyo game because I did make some payments. Like, I think I, I ended up, um, you know, I, I, t I took some losses. I didn't play optimally to get this Moyo situation. And like we said, um, these moves that you wouldn't be playing anyway, right, um, is not ideal. So I didn't play the the beginning of the game ideally i played it okay none of them was are terrible but yeah I, um prince alina makes an interesting point i know a lot of players who look at pro games see no points in the center and decide moyos aren't valuable yeah and as marty five says moyo is sold for cash elsewhere so just because the moyos themselves make no points doesn't mean that moyos aren't valuable and that's the really important thing to understand about moyo you don't play moyo to make points you make points to make points you know like obviously white isn't playing this joseki you know, and allowing black to cut on the right side because white wants to make more points than black in the local area, you know, obviously. So um, that's, that's I think, the really important takeaway with, with Moyo is that there's a degree of uh, flexibility and fluidity and that generally speaking, your Moyo is not the place you make cash, it's the commodity you trade for cash elsewhere on the board eventually, you know? And, you know, it may be because you're stronger than your opponent and you get to attack their groups. It may be because later your opponent has to spend extra moves to make your Moyo smaller and smaller. It may be, you know, it's it's never 
it's never clear. But the, the huge thing I, I, I the huge takeaway I think is important is that Moyo does not directly make points, and it's important to understand that. So. Yeah, so this was an interesting game. Somebody asked in chat finally what the result was. I believe I won this game by four points. I think I won by four, right? Yeah, let's wait, let's check. Um, yeah, I think I won by four, if I remember correctly. Um, if you bought your Moyo for a lot of cash, you got scammed. Also, yes, exactly. So your Moyo has to be relatively cheap, otherwise it's an investment. So. And that's why I don't entirely like what I did this game in the beginning, because I, I paid, like, moves such as, um, I mean, wait, this, I mean, this F, F5 was a payment, uh, this whole operation I made later, oh, wait, what? This whole operation I made later with O4 and, and M6 was a payment, so I'm not entirely happy with how I made the Moyo, because it's breaking the principle that Moyos should come for free, but hey, my Moyo wasn't free, but it, w it was cheap, at least, and later I, I played it very well, so I'm, um, this is one of my better Moyo games, I must say. Um, uh, okay, so I had a couple of other examples, but it's already it's already uh, one hour and a half into lectures. I think it's a good time to wrap it up. Um, it's a pity because there's some other good games. I actually have I, I have one game where someone played Moyo against me and played it very successfully. Um, but yeah, that I mean might be a topic for another lecture. Moyo Moyo number two um, because. I think that, you know, the the remaining games I have that I wanted to comment on, but I, unfortunately I don't really have um, have time for, are really interesting and carry also really good lessons about Moyo that I learned from them, from games that I played. So in a way, I, I almost want to do a Moyo 2 lecture, also because it's a topic I like. So we'll see if I can make a Moyo 2 lecture in the future. Um, these thematic lectures are always very clear and make me want to play a game afterwards. Good job. Oh, thank you for the kind words, Flyder Mouse. Very, very motivational. <laughs> Man. <laughs> yeah. Very understandable lecture. Thank you. Wow. Uh, yeah, glad, gl glad you people liked it. Um, yeah. So, uh, I guess uh, we'll, we'll wrap up the lecture here. Thank you to everyone who watched. Um, you know, uh, make sure to tune in to the next NGD lecture, I think in two weeks. Might not be me doing it, but you know, a lot of the other fantastic teachers might. So, um, you know, in the meanwhile, you can also check out the Nordic Godoja website. Uh, yeah, thank you for posting it. I think that that's Anti, uh, Anti's uh, kind of the, the he's the uh, pro who kind of runs the NGD um, uh, with, well, it's primarily him and, you know, the other teachers help him. So uh, yeah, check out the Nordic Odoja website if you're interested. We do text reviews and stuff. Um, and uh, we also have a Discord uh, server where uh, they discuss cooking a lot. Um, I, don't, I don't do that, but you know, they do. Um, and yeah, uh, thank you for watching everyone and uh, see you in two weeks or if, if you want to watch more lectures and uh, yeah, in general, see you around.